think we can just go ahead and get started and people who come in later um, can just catch up. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending tonight. Um, I'm going to ask that everyone mutes their mics throughout the event until they speak. Um, if we prompt you to speak, that's just to lessen any feedback noise throughout the event. Um, and just a reminder that the webinar is being recorded. So if you'd prefer to have your cameras off, feel free to do that. Um, and the video will be available to everyone later and as well as some resources that we'll hand out to people. Um, all of those things will be available to you later um, in a follow-up email. So um, to start, I think it'd be really nice if we all went around and introduced ourselves. Um, so please drop your name and your pronouns in the chat um, along with your favorite thing to eat or preserve in the winter and or a reason why you want to learn these preservation techniques while the staff goes around and introduces themselves with the same. So I'll start. My name is Merle. I use they, them pronouns. My favorite thing to eat um, or preserve in the winter are pears. And I choose to learn how to preserve because, um, because I want to become a little bit more self-reliant. Hey all, um, I'm Annie, I use she, her pronouns, and I would say top thing to preserve for me is peaches, uh, which I didn't get to preserve this year, um, but I typically do about 20 jars of peaches. <laughs> and last year I did some with um, cider and they're really delicious. So um, if you need any tips on peach preserving for next year, let me know. They're, it's definitely one of my favorites. I love that. Thank you all to everyone introducing yourself in the chat. If you um, didn't see that invitation, please feel free to write whatever you want there. Um, my name is Molly Rose. Uh, I'm an operations manager at Hope's Harvest. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. And um, I'm, I'm just like always so excited to talk about pickled things. So like shout out to all the pickle people. Um, especially love sauerkraut, which is what we'll be talking about tonight at the last section. Um, yeah, I'm just super stoked to be here talking preservation, um, which I just feel is like, if for me, it's been like tradition. I just like love feeling connected to this ancient art of preservation. Merle, don't forget to unmute. I want to hear your voice. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so I see that everyone's been introducing themselves. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Barbara. Melinda. I see some, I see a range of different uh, preservation experience um, and quite a few delicious vegetables and fruits named. Um, so to anyone who just joined, feel free to write your name, your pronouns in there, and any food that you prefer to preserve or um, why you choose to preserve. Um, and welcome to the Food Preservation Webinar with your hosts, Annie, Molly Rose, and Merle. Ava couldn't be here tonight. I mean, she might come in a little bit later, but um, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to go through the agenda for today. Um, we're gonna talk about some reasons for preserving food, a general overview of food preservation types and followed by some more in-depth overview of each type of technique and a demonstration along with that. And then at the very end, we're gonna have some Q&A, um, some time for Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, just drop your questions in the chat and I'll compile them and then we'll go through them at the very end. And then we'll also share some resources with you post webinar, we'll send them out to everyone who attended tonight. Um, it will also be on YouTube and all the resources will be on YouTube as well. So for anyone who didn't attend, they can find it there. Uh, 
Um, so why should we preserve food? Um, the goals for tonight are to teach people the skills that they need to preserve their season's bounty when it becomes too large to consume in a single go. Um, this can help people reduce food waste, uh, spend less money at the grocery store, and also supplement our diets because we'll be capturing those vegetables and fruits when they're at their peak flavor and peak nutrition content in a little time capsule that you'll be able to open in the dead of winter and enjoy. So if you buy locally during the season when farms are at peak production, you can save that produce for the off season by preserving it. Um, and by eating local, you can support local farming practices rather than industrialized farming and cross country shipping of produce. I mean, usually I find that preserved food that you make at home tastes more flavorful and vibrant than food from the grocery store anyway, because that food has undergone a lot of processing, chemical pesticides, uh, preservatives and GMOs to be shipped such long distances. It's also super fun to learn how to cook and make delicious sauces and jams and allow yourself to tap into that creativity. And you'll learn skills that will last you a lifetime and will help you become a little more self-reliant. You can also share these with your family and friends and neighbors. Oh, I love it. Um, I see a lot of people in the chat talking about food waste, which is super cool. Um, because we at Hope's Harvest love thinking about food waste. Um, Hope's Harvest brings people together to glean food directly from farms that grow it. Um, we forge relationships with the receiving and the giving ends. Um, you've all been a part of that. That's amazing. Um, and I know I've had a lot of conversations in the field with people about gleaning being an ancient practice that reduces food waste while also feeding people. Um, and we think about the work that we do and how it aligns with our values, we can feel um, empowered through resiliency and reliance on ourselves and our communities through this cleaning work that we do. Um, knowing that you have homemade preserved food on hand for the colder months means more food security. Um, and that's a core value of what we do at Hope's Harvest. Um, and we're so glad that you joined us here to think about reducing our food waste and increasing our food knowledge and how it's integral to our mission, um, not just as an organization, but just like, you know, as, as people. Um, and this is knowledge that's for you, but it's also for you to share. What we do doesn't exist in a vacuum. These are skills for you to share and experiment with. Um, so please pay it forward and pass it on. If you learned something here tonight, I hope that you'll um, get excited about it with someone else that's in your life. Um, and um, yeah, this is just like the beginning of the conversation. So we're really excited to continue talking about these delicious foods with you um, all winter and into next season. We're gonna be covering um, four methods of food preservation. If you have others, let me know, because I love to learn. Um, we're gonna go dehydration. Um, great for when storage space is tight. Um, not every food can be dehydrated, but the ones that can are super delicious. Um, taking the water content out really just like locks in flavors, great trail snack. Um, you know, like it's just wonderful and Annie's a pro. Um, also gonna be talking about freezing, um, which is the opposite because keeping the water in, but that really helps preserve a lot of freshness. Um, you do need a freezer. You need root space in that freezer, which can be, you know, tight sometimes. I live with a lot of people. I don't know about anyone else, but um, if you have the freezer space for it, it's really, really wonderful way to keep fresh food um, and make it feel um, almost like it did when it was first harvested. Um, and we're also going to be talking about canning, um, which is really new to me, so I'm really excited to learn about that. Um, and that's using heat process and pressure to preserve food in glass jars. A real popular one is tomato sauce, which Merle's going to walk us through. Um, but all kinds of things can be canned in really interesting ways. And it is like the newer development in the food preservation world relative to all these other methods that we're talking about. So it's exciting to think about technology and food preservation as well. And lastly, we're going to be talking about fermentation and specifically lacto-fermentation or wild culture fermentation. Um, and we're going to be increasing the acidity of foods. Um, we're going to be generating some pr probiotics. That might be like a buzzword for uh, a lot of people who are interested in food. Um, and yeah, we're going to be creating like living culture things to really, you know, make food that is vibrant and alive last through the winter. Okay. 
<laughs> and I'm going to be um, walking you through the dehydration process. Like Molly was saying, um, a lot of these preservation methods are rooted in tradition. And I realized going through this process of creating the presentation, um, the tradition, it was rooted for me. And it was actually during this time of year, my mom, she used to make these dried apple wreaths. Um, during uh, the holiday times. And I remember being at her craft fair booth underneath the table, eating the dried apples before she would make wreaths out of them. And I don't think they were the actually best apples to eat, um, but <laughs> still was doing it as a kid. And um, I just remember they tasted like soft candies to me. So I think that walking through the dehydration process again and starting to dehydrate more things um, recently has been really exciting for me. Um, so dehydration is one of the more simple forms of food preservation. Um, you can keep it as simple as using the sun uh, as your dehydrator or a little more high tech would be getting an actual dehydrator, um, which I'll go in a little bit more in depth on the next slide. Uh, it's one of the more compact and energy efficient ways to preserve your food for the winter, um, which makes a great option for people with tight space. Like right now, I'm in a smaller apartment that um, definitely needs to conserve space on storing. So I haven't been actually doing as much canning this year and I've been doing a lot more dehydrating. Um, and then the three biggest things to keep in mind when you're dehydrating is the temperature, the airflow and consistency throughout the process. Um, the temperature shouldn't be hot enough to cook the food. Um, this would lose a lot of the key nutrients, which are one of the benefits of dehydrating, um, but also shouldn't be cool enough where the active enzymes would cause the food to spoil. Um, so you'll hear the word enzyme being thrown around a lot during a couple of the presentations. Um, all living organisms have biological processes that get triggered um, by chemical reactions. And the process we're more so focusing on with these enzymes tonight is the ripening process. Um, so the enzyme in the ripening process is the catalyst to these chemical reactions. So with preserving, you want to stop those enzymes from being triggered. Um, and that ideal temperature for your dehydration to do that is between 120 and 180 degrees. Um, but know that that also changes with what you are preserving. Um, and during the video, um, I use a dehydrator called the Excalibur. Um, I just wanted to list the price just in case anyone is curious. Uh, I would say the initial investment for a dehydrator is the thing that a lot of people um, may, may look at and not go towards that route. But I would say I was looking at other prices and it can range from $60 for a really small one to $300. So I think it's a wide gap and um, you can hopefully find one that works for you. And there are alternatives to dehydrators, like the sun is a great one. Um, I saw some really great resources, um, which I can include on the email that Merle is sending out uh, for a solar dehydrator that you could build. Um, your oven, a wood stove, and an air fryer. Um, so I listed the pros and cons um, I would say the only con that I would say would be initial cost and the noise. Um, but other than that, dehydration, I could, it's, it's really amazing. <laughs> so it's energy efficient, saves on propane, um, it's a uniform product, and it has a really long shelf life if you do get that dehydration temperatures right. Um, and like I said, it saves on space. Um, so next is the video, and I'll be dehydrating uh, beets alongside yeah. And um, I don't know if a lot of you know, but I do work at this farm called Seven Arrows Farm. And so the animals you'll be seeing uh, in the video are from Seven Arrows and then my pup, Ralphie. So here's a dehydration video. <laughs> Hey y'all, this is Annie. I'm going to be walking you through the steps for dehydrating beets. First, I'm going to be touching upon the optimal time to harvest, which is after the first light frost. 
This stimulates the plant to turn their starches that they've been saving up all year into sugars that prevent the roots from freezing. When you harvesting your beets for preserving, start by separating the greens from the tops, but don't toss those greens. I'll touch up on that at the end of the video. Each variety of beets have a different type of sweetness, so be sure to grow multiple varieties for a wide range of flavors. I grew Chioga, Touchstone, and Ace in my garden. The first step in preserving is to get those beets clean. This gets rid of microorganisms that can survive the dehydration process and reduce the shelf life. Step two is to peel and slice. Peeling can take out that bitter flavor that resides in the skin, but isn't necessary. The slicing is the key part though. Keep your slices uniform so that all dry at a similar rate. I use the reference of two quarters to see how thick I want them. Now let's take a moment because the Chioga variety and the orange touchstone are some psychedelic sisters that deserve some admiration. Step three is to place the slices an eighth of an inch to a fourth of an inch apart on your racks. This gives the beets enough airflow for the dehydration to be more uniform. Step four is to set your dehydrator between 120 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. You should allow this to run for eight to 10 hours before turning it off to cool. Once you've made sure all the moisture is out, it's time to store your beets in a glass jar with a sealed lid. Or for longer storage life, I recommend a Ziploc bag with all the air squeezed out. And like I said, save those beet greens. Beets are in the same family as Swiss chard and can be sauteed up just the same. Like the beet roots, they are high in iron and sugars to get us ready for those winter months. Lovely. I'll do mine. Go back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> How's that for everybody? Was that good? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everyone, Sorry. for the patience. We did practice this like 10 times. <laughs> um, so these are a few other things that I have dehydrated besides just the beets. Um, but the beets are pretty beautiful if you do get a chance to dehydrate some. Um, I dehydrated some URI pears and apples. Um, my friend grows mushrooms, so I got to dehydrate those, which I feel really lucky about. Um, and then I grew a ton of hot peppers, um, these ones called Bangkok Thai chilies, and then um, these really small yellow ones called Pequeño peppers. Um, they're more like a pepperoncini, and you typically put the dry peppers in oil after that to get a really good flavor. Um, so the next one we're going to be talking about is freezing. Um, so with freezing, it's actually, I would say, probably next to dehydration, one of the more simple techniques. Um, and it does capture the flavor of the food really well um, because there's not a whole lot of processing that is happening. Um, so most requ vegetables require um, a blanching or a cooking before freezing. Um, and like I was saying in the dehydrator video, uh, the enzymes, uh, that's what we're trying to stop that action from happening. Uh, you can freeze foods on a cookie sheet that allows uh, the foods to be separated before you actually put them in the bags to go in the freezer. Uh, it makes it easier than pulling out an entire block of broccoli that might be frozen together. And you don't have to defaw that whole block of broccoli. Instead, you can just like get a handful of pieces together. Um, downsides for freezing can definitely be space and the cost and energy it is to run the freezer. That definitely is the downside for me and why I haven't done as much freezing um, this year too, is definitely when you don't have a chest freezer, you can fill up a regular freezer space really fast. Um, so one of the things to point out for freezing is that uh, some of the things I like to think about is portion control when you're putting them in the freezer. Um, if you think of how you're going to be using the piece of food or like a bag of broth, um, make sure that the portions for that food are accurate to how you're going to be cooking it rather than a huge bag of broth, maybe not the best for like one person. So um, just think about that before actually doing the freezing process. Um, we're going to try this video and if not, Merle's just going to pull it up again on their computer. 
The second video I'm going to be walking you through is the process of freezing and blanching. First, give your broccoli a good rinse and cut it into uniform pieces off the stalk. Same as the beets, this uniformity is key to the proper blanching. The second step is optional but helpful. I soak mine in salt water, making sure that all the broccoli is touching. This removes any bugs and critters that have been carried in from the garden. Massage it into the florets and allow it to soak for 35 minutes. Personally, I like to compare my cooking with music. So this soak is roughly as long as the classic 1987 Dirty Dancing soundtrack. Step three is the start of the collection process. Steam one inch of water in a deep pot. Once the water is up to a boil, turn it down to a simmer and pour the strained broccoli into the colander that's nested in the large pot. Allow the broccoli to sit in the steamer for three to five minutes, which gives you enough time to listen to the 1967 legend B.B. King in his song Gambler Blues. Step five, you're going to need a bowl of ice water. Take the steamed broccoli and place it in the water to slow down the cooking process. Leave the broccoli there until it's cool to the touch. The process of blanching locks in the nutrients and the flavor. All fruit and vegetables contain chemical compounds called enzymes. Blanching causes those enzymes to become inactive, which allows the nutrients to be locked into the vegetable. I like to compare it to fixing a leak in a bucket. Once the leak stopped, all the water can stay in the bucket for future use. The step six is to strain for a final time and load your broccoli into that freezer pot. Push out any extra air before closing the bag and place it into your freezer for future soups and stir fries. The broccoli should be used within a year, but I tend to use mine by the end of the winter. Awesome. Thank you, Annie. Yeah. So Merle's going to take it over now yeah. um, and just give us a little run through about reducing food scraps. So um, one great way to reduce food waste is to actually make your own veggie broth at home from food scraps that you use every day. Um, most people don't actually know that they can make their own veggie broth at home. So put together a video uh, detailing how you can do that. Let me just share my screen. <laughs> no, do you want to just keep your screen on the PowerPoint? Okay, that works. Um, While it's loading, uh, Annie, maybe you can answer Lil's pressing question as to why there's a frog in the freezer. <laughs> you know, Lil, I, I have a thing for frog legs, really long. <laughs> uh, no, do you, it actually, frog legs reminds me of that book. Have any of you read the book Cannery Row by John Steinbeck? Where there, there's just like a bunch of, there's like this farmer and he was like running around and there's a fire at the house and they were all trying to catch frogs for frog legs. That's what it reminds me of. I don't know why there's a frog in the freezer, but they will. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Today I will be showing you how to make veggie broth with food scraps. First step is to save your veggie scraps as you cook. I usually put them in an aluminum can that I'd open while cooking, and then I place it in the freezer. You can also put it in a freezer bag, as you can see here. Then I put the veggie scraps in a large pot to boil. Usually I'll wait until I accumulate a lot of food scraps before making a big batch of veggie broth, so that's why I store it in the freezer. The next step is to fill the pot to the top with water. Then you bring the water to a boil and you lower it to a simmer and you could leave it on for many hours. Minimum, leave it on for two hours. Another option is using a slow cooker or crock pot. Your next step is to strain the broth. Once you've strained it, you'll have all this gunky, really overcooked veggies. Um, I usually compost them. But after that, you're pretty much done and you can use the broth right away or you could place it in a freezer bag and store it to use it at a later time. 
And here I just wanted to show you all what it looks like when it's been frozen. To thaw it, I'll run it under hot water or just leave it out on the counter. So here we have that video. Um, Can everyone see my screen? Cool. So um, next we'll be talking about canning. Um, canning is a relatively recent development compared to the long history of drying, salting, and fermenting foods. And it didn't actually come about until the late 18th century and became a reliable preservation method for traveling army bases and sailors. Um, so the first person to play with this method was named Nicholas Appert, um, developed the method to remove air and seal a jar for preservation. And after many, uh, I guess about 30 years, um, they found a reason why it works. And it, um, once they knew the science behind canning, that's when things really started to change. Canning food became a large shift for agriculture, especially during the industrial Re revolution. And it allowed the working class to access a wider variety of nutritious food throughout the seasons. <clears throat> How relevant it is today to shift back towards these food preservation methods that empower us to safely capture the essence of our local farmers so we can enjoy them when things are a little less abundant in New England. Um, so canning involves applying heat to food and removing the air from the jar to create a seal, which stops the spoilage and makes it shelf stable. Um, when you are canning, you have to pay close attention to the acidity of the food that you're canning. Um, so for the water bath method, which I'll be showing you today, you generally can only can acidic foods with a pH under 4.6. Um, so these include things like fruits, fruit juices, jams and jellies, salsas, fresh tomatoes with added acid, which means adding vinegar or lemon juice to it pickles and relishes, chutneys, vinegars, condiments. Um, some things that you can't can with this method are green beans, potatoes, uh, sweet peppers, meats, things that are not as acidic. But you can always reliably refer to the USDA home canning guide, which I have linked here, and you'll also have linked, um, you will receive in the list of resources that we send out to everyone who attended tonight. Um, so, there are proper techniques to canning food in a way that um, prevents spoilage. Um, collectively, these practices remove oxygen, destroy enzymes, which Annie mentioned earlier, and prevents the growth of undesirable bacteria, yeasts, and molds. Um, and it helps form a high vacuum in, jar, in jars. So good vacuums form tight seals, which keep liquid in and air and microorganisms so when you are choosing things to can, make sure that you're washing and carefully selecting fresh food. You might have to peel some, make sure you're adding the correct amount of acid, um, using acceptable jars and self-sealing lids, like generally new ones that haven't been dented, um, and making sure you use the correct canning process. So there's a boiling water process and a pressure canner process. And for things that are less acidic, you would need to use the pressure canner, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so some do's and don'ts, um, like I said, um, don't tr try to use new mason jars, new lids, ones that aren't used or dented. You can also preheat jars in the dishwasher or um, simmer them in water, which I will show you all the, the method that I did um, in the video. And make sure you have a proper headspace. Um, if you leave too much headspace, um, it can result in a weak vacuum and a weak seal, and too little headspace may force food um, under the lid, and that causes siphoning and breaking of the seal. You can, I, again, you can always refer to a tested recipe using different types of vegetables and fruits um, in the USDA home canning guide. Also, for your safety, um, this is a big, I know this is a large, text slide, but botulism is something that you can potentially um, you can potentially harm yourself with if you don't can properly. I saw someone mentioning it earlier in the chat. Um, so make sure that you are find, following the USD in, endorsed recommendations, such as like boiling food for 10 minutes um, after you've opened the can. Um, and 
there are some things that just to be aware of um, that if the food wasn't processed in a pressure canner and it was like not acidic enough, it's probably unsafe to eat um, and making sure you're following all the recommended processing times, pressure um, needs for the, the canning method that you used. So here's the video. I wonder if I could play it from here. I'm actually just gonna play it from my laptop so we can make it full screen. Here we go. Today I'll be showing you all how to can tomato sauce. To start out, you're going to want a large pot. I use a 12 quart pot, a ladle that can easily fit the mason jar funnel, which is a special funnel that fits into the wide mouth mason jars. I use a wide mouth mason jar because those are the easiest to use when canning with this method. And then you want the mason jar lids, a two piece ring and the disc to fit the wide mouth. You'll also want tongs, salt, and vinegar. Then you'll want to bring your tomato sauce to a rolling boil, as you can see here. You want it to be as hot as possible, and also bring a pot of hot water to a rolling boil. The next step is to place the mason jar and the lid in the pot of boiling water with the tongs, and you want to leave it in there for a few minutes. You can also run the mason jars through a dishwasher and heat dry it beforehand for extra sanitation. So after a few minutes, you'll want to lift the mason jar out slowly using tongs and slowly pour out the hot water, being careful not to burn yourself. Then you place the mason jar on the counter, the funnel in the mason jar, and then you're gonna add salt and vinegar, depending on the proportions of the recipe that you're using. And then you slowly ladle the tomato sauce into the mason jar, being careful not to get any on the lip of the mason jar, and leaving about half an inch of space. And one thing I do after ladling it in is I wipe down the lip of the mason jar to make sure that there's nothing that could hinder the seal. I carefully place the disc on the jar with the tongs, and the whole thing will be really hot, so I use a rag to hold on to the jar as I screw the lid on. Make sure to label your jars with the date and the vegetable that you used. And here's a video showing the suction that this canning method creates. As you can see, it's pretty strong and I struggled a little bit to break the seal before it finally opened. And one thing that I did want to mention is I, in this video, left a little bit of a little bit too much space um, of headspace. So just be aware of that. Um, I used the the jar like the very next day. So <laughs> um, and I obviously I also boiled it for 10 minutes before um, putting it in any of my meals. So cool. Thanks, Merle. Um, I'm seeing some great questions. I am collecting them. If you have more questions, keep dropping them in chat, and then we'll do a Q&A um, right after this short section on fermentation, um, which is something I love to talk about. And it's because it's like this like magical transformation um, of microbes um, of vegetables. Um, and I... It really, I mean, it's, it, it can be, you can have like a quick pickle, which is like adding some vinegar, which in itself is fermented. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is like a live culture fermentation or a lacto fermentation, which is named for lactobacilli, which is naturally occurring on all of your vegetables already. You don't have to do anything extra to get it there. It just is there, which is so cool. It's like nature saying we want fermentation to happen. Um, so it's harnessing the power of, of those microbes. Um, and living cultures are amazing, um, not only at preserving food, but also for our bodies and nourishing our systems. 
so good for our immune systems. Um, and um, one of my favorite things to talk about is, um, you know, like improving our gut health is, is physical, but it's also mental and emotional because most of our serotonin is made in our gut. So when you are feeding yourself live culture foods in the winter and like eating the sauerkraut that you made with the cabbage that you harvested in the fall, um, just know that like that mood boost that you get is chemical. So that's really, really cool. Um, and fermentation also really allows us to absorb a lot of nutrients from our vegetables. So something that I've heard Merle and Annie say a few times is about like capturing the power of these, of these vegetables while they're at their peak. Um, and fermentation really highlights that because it's, it's, um, you know, kind of encompassing everything in these living, living symbiotic relationships of microbes and yeast and bacteria and molds. Um, and, and allowing them to really shine with their nutrients. Um, and then you're getting all of that beneficial probiotic um, goodness in your body, um, not to mention all of the other um, compounds that are created during the fermentation process, which is when the microbes are digesting all of those things. Um, so your, your body's more able to absorb all of these things. Not to mention fermentation is, makes things delicious. Some of our favorite foods that we eat are fermented. You might not even know it, um, but if you think about it, probably all the things you love to eat are fermented. I know that's very true for me. Um, cheese and yogurt are fermented. Sauerkraut and kimchi are fermented. People's gateway fer ferment. We also often talk about kombucha and that's becoming like a main, a main stay in our culture as well. And, um, you know, it's, you can find it in at like the gas station now. Um, but if you're looking to get started, that's a place I hear a lot of people get started. And part of that, actually, my, my favorite thing about kombucha is the sharing of the, of the scooby of the mother and about that, like pass it forward culture has always been really true for me in learning about fermentation. Just so just like shout out to all the people that have taught me how to do this. It's very much like this labor of love. And I, and I see that in all of preservation methods, um, of really just like wanting to share this knowledge because it, it really is empowering. So being able to make your own ferments at home, um, it, it's, it shouldn't feel daunting. Um, you know, you might need a few equipment things if you're trying to go for like an alcoholic fermentation. Um, but we're really just going to be talking, focusing on the vegetables here right now. Um, and I have a video where I made too much sauerkraut um if i'm being honest i probably could have done this video about like with like one cabbage but i just decided to give you a little window into my reality which is that i like to go big uh, i like to make sauerkraut for the whole winter and enough to share um with you all um and so thank you for letting me share it and this is that yeah oh you mind restarting it with audio Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. When I have an abundance of vegetables, my favorite thing to do is make lacto or wild fermented things like sauerkraut. Here I'll be using cabbage, carrots, and apples from cleaning trips, as well as a few other ingredients. First, you'll want to slice or shred your vegetables. Make sure to cut out cores or any other parts of the vegetable you don't want. The size is up to you. I like to experiment with different shapes and thicknesses. You can chop by hand or use a tool like a mandolin or food processor. Make sure, of course, to keep your fingers out of the way. That can really mess up a batch of kraut. Get yourself a large bowl to toss in your shredded vegetables. Then, for the most important part of the process, salt. I salt as I go, and the best gauge for how much is going to be your taste buds. You can find plenty of recipes and ratios of salt to veg while you're getting started, but always use your instincts by trying some and adjusting based on how it's tasting. Then, if you're like me, you've shredded so much cabbage that you have to move outside to mix it all up because cabbage has a lot of water, allow for the salt to do most of the work in drawing it out for you. Massage the cabbage by squeezing and applying pressure. You'll start to feel it become limp and less squeaky as the water draws out and salt coats evenly. Of course, you must taste it to make sure you're on track to yummy, delicious kraut that is to your taste. Mine tasted good, but still needed an extra splash of salt. You'll also start to add all of the other amazing, wonderful things that will be incorporated into your kraut. And if you just want cabbage, that's great too. But here you'll see me add some onion, apples, carrots, and shallots. Again, this is just what I had around and what I was feeling that day. And that's one of the beautiful things about this process. It's adaptable to the harvest and to your pantry. 
I mix and taste at every step, then you'll add the stronger stuff. Not only are garlic and ginger super potent and tasty, they are medicinal and antimicrobial. So they help prevent bad bacteria from taking over and they also support your immune system. I also love adding chili peppers, herbs, and spices at this point. Then you realize you forgot to add the beautiful green onions from the weekend's farmer's market. So you give those a quick chop. And here you can see my camera guy toasting up some sesame seeds, which is one of my favorite flavors to add to the mix. Then I mix it all up pretty good and allow for it to sit for a bit of time. This allows the salt to work its magic and cultures to start pre-digesting the vegetables. And we took a little break and even changed locations. Kraut is very mobile, though this bowl was very heavy. Once safely home, uh, pack your kraut into fermentation vessels. Here I used glass jars, uh, which work super well and give the added benefit of being able to see the action happen. You can also use a crock or a bucket, but I recommend only ceramic, glass, or food grade plastic to avoid the acid causing leaching. As you pack, make sure things stay compact by pressing firmly and slowly like a French press. This will release air pockets where mold could develop. Once it's mostly full, make sure there's plenty of room for brine at the top. The action of the microbes will cause things to bubble up and weights keep things submerged. This is an anaerobic process, which means you want vegetables under brine and without oxygen at all times. And here I used a full cabbage leaf and a core that I saved, which has the added benefit of detracting bad bacteria and creating a barrier between the air and the kraut. For the first few days of fermentation, you'll want to press down at least once a day, cover loosely with lid or cloth and rubber band, and keep uh, a plate underneath to protect from overflow. Label clearly with the date, I promise this will make your life easier later. Uh, then put somewhere out of sunlight and allow to ferment until you are satisfied with the taste. I usually go anywhere from 3 to 14 days, depending on the ingredients, my palate, the temperature. Um, cold will slow fermentation. At this point, you are done and your kraut can be stored in smaller jars in the refrigerator. Lifespan is essentially indefinite as long as the kraut stays under brine. Congrats on making living foods to feed your body and your neighbors through the winter. Yay! Awesome. Thanks for bearing with our internet, y'all. It was so good to get to watch those videos, um, which were super fun to make. Um, I know I had a blast. Um, and I've been collecting your, like, I'm just so overjoyed with all of these questions. They are, I'm living for your questions. If you still have them, please keep them coming. Um, but it seems like, you know, any of us can kind of just answer um, if you're called to me, Merle, and Annie. Um, also, please, like, there aren't a lot of people here tonight, and I know a lot of you all are experts in your own ways in some of these topics. So if you have an answer or you want to offer some, some of your own wisdom, I would totally invite you to go off mute and just, you know, hop in. Um, the, more, the more voices, the better. Um, so the very first question we had, like the very beginning of this was Connie wanted to know, is botulism real? It sounds like a conspiracy against home canning. Lily said plus one, like, let's talk about it. I don't know that much about canning, but I would love to hear more. <laughs> botulism is not a conspiracy theory. Um, it is real. And I don't think that the government would take I mean, the USDA, not the government, would take so much precaution against uh, telling people um, the like safety uh, hazards of canning at home um, if it wasn't real. So it definitely is real. And I definitely recommend that people like really read into it before um, doing their own canning at home. The method that I showed you all, just for the record, is not officially the water bath method approved by the USDA. It is just how I can at home and I take my own risk when I make, when I can that way. Um, but like I said, I always boil everything that I open for at least 10 minutes before eating it. And um, that is a risk that I take myself. Um, but you will definitely have access to that resource. Um, 
in the follow-up email and it will also be in the video description on YouTube um, for anyone who wants to read more about the hazards of canning and, and botulism. <laughs> So Connie had a follow up um, and then I'll go back to the order of the questions, but so it's adding acids to make it safe and, and you can find recipes and ratios for that. Yes. Yes. So um, like certain things like, um, like hot sauce or condiments, um, those things typically are really acidic. Um, tomatoes are typically the most, I think the most acidic vegetable fruit there is. Also, if it's a vegetable or a fruit is <laughs> contended as well. Um, so that's why typically people will can tomato sauce because it is already naturally very acidic. Um, anything, and, and even with tomato sauce, you need to still add an acid and that's just for, for good measure. So yeah, you do need to add um, an acid and salt um, because that helps make what you're canning even more acidic and, and safer. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, and I'm seeing that there's lots of other ideas about where to get canning information. So if you have like a good webinar, a good reading, or a good book, like please feel free to share in the chat. Um, it seems like there were a couple questions about um, dehydration. Um, Melinda wanted to know, are there electric dehydrators? Um, Annie, maybe you can speak a little bit about the one that you used in the video. Um, and Connie wanted to know if anyone's using a wood stove to dehydrate. So some dehydration questions. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Awesome. Um, so for dehydration, I would say the one that I use, the Excalibur, is an electric dehydrator. I think most of the ones that you're going to find um, that you can purchase are ones that probably plug into the wall. Um, yeah, and the wood stove one, I had a wood stove up in Maine and I dehydrated apple slices on the wood stove. And it was more so just like a tedious process of me having air moving on them. So like a small fan and then me flipping the um, pieces of apples over. Um, it's harder just because it's more inconsistent heat coming through the um, stove, but I know that they probably make dehydrators like that you can fit on top of your stove. I've never seen one, but um, whoever talked about the wood stove heating, I think it was, um, does anybody want to unmute themselves and talk about wood stove dehydrating if they're, if they're willing? There's someone up in Vermont not calling anyone out, but. <laughs> Connie, if you could unmute, yeah. Um, hi. Um, yeah, I have a wood stove here, and I just like to hang a window screen um, or screen like material above the wood stove for apple chips and just drying citrus peel all winter. It's really nice. These are things that like, aren't going to go bad really quick and um, can just kind of hang out for a while. Yeah, that's sort of what I was doing too. That's nice to know that it was a similar method. Um, yeah, it's the perfect time for that type of stuff too. It's beautiful decorations as well. That's so cool. Um, we also have a few questions about, um, about eating dehydrated things. Amanda wanted to know how do you eat the dried beets? Um, and then Pamela, wanted to know about drying herbs um, to use as condiments later. So some like culinary side of things. Totally. Um, so with the herbs, I would say lowest heat as possible. Um, herbs are really sensitive to high heat and they can crisp and burn them pretty easily. Similar to how you just don't want to put like boiling water on tea leaves. Like you want to let the water cool before you put it on your tea leaves. Um, that same process is with um, dehydrating herbs, just because the faster you dry them, the more um, their cell walls will break. And so that will lose a lot of the essential oils and a lot of those things that you wanna keep in the herbs. So a slow drying process allows the cell walls to collapse on themselves rather than burst. Um, and so I would say definitely dehydrate herbs, that's awesome. If you have a place to slow dry them just hanging, I personally just do that just because the flavor of the herb is better than risking you crisping it in the dehydrator. So I would say drying by hanging or on a screen, um, like 
uh, Connie was saying. Um, and yeah, I would say those two things for dehydrating herbs. And then for the beet chips, I like saving them for stews. Um, I really just put them pretty much in every soup that I make just because it's a really, really nice sweet add-on um, to like a really beefy stew. Uh, and you can eat them raw, not the best. Um, I know that you can probably like prepare them a little differently. I've seen people do vinegar brines um, with their beets before they put them in the dehydrator, which has been really nice and is a little bit more pleasant. Um, but pizza, <laughs> I would put them in something. <laughs> Unless you're, you're brave and you can just like, yeah, do that. <laughs> Thanks That's for asking great. those questions, though. I love it. Brian, when you think about marinating first and becoming beet chips, yeah, I would definitely want to experiment with that. Um, so uh, we have, uh, we had some questions come in and it got chatted a little bit about, about al the culmination of alcohol and, ferment and vegetables. Um, and then also just like some excitement in the chat going on around alcoholic fermentation about how we can kind of combine that with our mission at Hope Harvest around gleaning fresh produce. Um, can we preserve things in alcohol? I'm curious if anyone's done this. I guess they really have. Um, I haven't done it. I've, I've drank a New England cider company cider that's made out of beet roots and um, carrots. <laughs> so that's technically <laughs> some type of fermentation with, um, with veggies. But I also, that's really interesting that you put in the chat about like the comparison of making similar like a tincture. Um, that you typically make with medicinal herbs and using alcohol and water mixture to pull out those really great nutrients and constituents in the plant themselves. And so I, I find it like an interesting conversation that I actually don't know how it goes with when you're using, um, when you're using fresh food instead. So yeah, that would be really something I'd be interested in keeping in touch with. And maybe we can do a follow-up on the email if we do find an answer to it. Yeah, I think that'd be really cool. Definitely something I would want to experiment with. The idea of the tincture being you're preserving those medicinal qualities of those plants. And like, can we do that with vegetables? You know, we're talking yeah. about being the harvest at its peak. Yeah, so that's really, really cool and very experimental. Um, Kelvin wanted to know it, uh, if you include salt in your veggie broth. Um, Ralph, you want to speak to your veggie broth? That'd be cool. Um, I don't put salt in my veggie broth. I don't think, um, just because if I were to add salt, I'd probably add it later in the soup that I use um, the veggie broth in. But for like preserving purposes, if it's going in the freezer, um, I don't think it necessarily needs salt. I don't know. Annie, maybe you could speak more on this. Yeah. yeah, so I um, I tend to put salt in everything, um, and I think salt pulls out a lot of flavors, and I know that when, um, I think you can do it both ways, not saying that one may be better than the other, but I think I, I prefer the method of putting the salt in the broth. Um, before putting it in the freezer and then you can taste it and add more when you're actually cooking it. But I think that salt in the boiling process when cooking down, um, it definitely pulls out some of the flavors of the veggies. You just gotta be aware of not salting it too much just because you're putting the salt in when you have a ton of water and then it's gonna condense and then get real salty. So um, maybe just do it throughout the process rather than right at the beginning. That's really great. I also saw, I also put in a dash of vinegar. I, I guess I'm, I just made a lot of bone broth and I've just gotten used to it. Should I, is that okay to do? Am I okay doing a little acid in it? Cool. I, it sounds like you got three different options from three different people. Um, so let us know what you wind up trying and what tastes good to you. Be super curious um, what all of your adventures in preservation look like this winter um, and hope you'll be in touch. We have a few more questions and feel free to keep dropping them. I know I can stay on for at least another 10 or 15 minutes answering questions. 
Um, and then again, if anything, you know, follows up or tonight you're lying in bed trying to fall asleep and you're like, oh, but I have this burning question about dehydrating, like, please send us an email. Um, and we're happy to do research as well um, because we do not know everything. Um, we are all learning. And so, um, Okay, actually, I'll answer this one, I think, because I think this was for me. But Amanda asked, um, what do you eat sauerkraut with? Great question, Amanda. Um, my first answer is everything. I eat it with everything. Um, but um, in preparation for this, I actually took a few photos of things that I was making with it and totally forgot to include them on the slide, and I'm just realizing that now. <laughs> but the, one of the first photos I took um, was of, um, I took some like, I, I made a sandwich with um, some, uh, some mayonnaise and sauerkraut and a fried egg. And just like, boy, if that isn't the best sandwich ever. Um, and so, yeah, I, I love the combo of like creamy things with sauerkraut for some reason, like that like texture really feels good. And like the acid and like the fattiness or creaminess of anything, depending on like your diet. If you eat dairy, um, love like goat cheese or like avocado, um, if we're going like, you know, not not super local. Um, but there's, there's plenty of ways to tie it in. Um, sauerkraut goes great in like, soups and stews um sauerkraut is great um just as like a side dish um you can mix it with things i've like made like roasted potatoes and then like put a little bit of sauerkraut and just like give it a stir and it's like a whole different meal it can just like the flavors of it are really really layered and complex and so it can really heighten or transform something even as just like an added it like you don't need like a whole spoonful of it or you can eat it out of the jar like me um, so, and, and it depends on what flavors you're playing with. Sauerkraut can take on so many different types of flavors. Um, obviously you can just like put it on a hot dog or a broth and with some mustard and that's a whole like gourmet experience as well. Um, so I hope that you'll, you'll get in touch and let, let us know, um, what, what you end up doing with your sauerkraut. The one I made is like very, very gingery as well as with the toasted sesame flavors. So someone else commented about the sesame seeds and like, that is like my favorite, <laughs> my favorite things uh, I put in there. So the garlic, the ginger, and the toasted sesame, they seem to go with everything. You really can't go wrong. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my long-winded answer, uh, impassioned answer about how to eat sauerkraut. Um, and then Lily asked, um, have y'all made things like hot sauce or other condiments? Curious what, that, curious what that process is like. And I can answer that from a fermentation perspective, but I know Merle and Annie would probably have answers too. And um, I make lacto-fermented hot sauce, um, which basically involves something that actually Connor brought up, which is um, whole brined vegetables. So I'll actually just do like a salt brine um, and, uh, and put hot peppers like right in it whole. Um, allow them to ferment for like a week um, with other things like any sort of like medicinal roots. Like I like to throw like my garlic in there, maybe a little oregano um, and then I'll blend it up and it becomes like this like living hot sauce. So there's, there's all kinds of ways to do that process. That's what a fermented hot sauce would look like. I'm curious, Annie and Merle, if you want to add in on that topic, hot topic. they're in a mute battle, so they have to like- Yeah, I am. Um, so instead of hot sauce, but it is sort of a condiment, I've made fermented salsa before and it's so good and so simple. Um, and it's very similar, just the salting and letting the um, lactobacillus culture actually do that fermenting process for you. And so um, that whole thing is just making salsa like you would typically make a fresh salsa with tomatoes, onions, cilantro, um, and some lime, and then salt. And then um, you can leave it in a glass bowl with a cloth over the lid or paper towels and leave it out for a couple days and then taste it until you like how tangy it is. And then put it in the fridge and probably use it within the next week or two. But um, yeah, I would say, I've also made um, lacto-fermented hot sauce too, and it's so good. The tanginess is just something you can't really replicate. It's, um, it's really amazing. So I would suggest uh, if we have any resources, we can share some on um, hot sauces as well, because that would be a really fun one to try. That's great. Um, 
I'm coming up short on any other questions that came up specifically in the chat. Um, although I am happy to talk about whole brand vegetables, if that's of interest to anyone. Um, and, um, but if, if, you, if you have a lingering question, um, either drop it in the chat or come off mute and go ahead and ask. Um, otherwise, we'll start to do our like wrap up things and um, you can always follow up with questions. Tommy here. Uh, I had a question about, just, you know, how um, how long do you think it would take for like lactobacillus to like fully take over an environment of like a hot sauce or a salsa or whatever? I don't know. If I hear like a couple days or leave it out for this or that, but I don't know if you have a better sense of like how long it would take to really like take over the vegetable world. That's a really good question, and. So what Connie's kind of referring to here is like, there are different stages of the lacto-fermentation process and the lactobacilli is a part of it at every stage, but it really doesn't become like the major player in the, in our, in the, in the environment until the average I hear is seven to 14 days. But the, 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 the true answer is like, it depends on so many factors. We're talking temperature, we're talking what the vegetable is, the soil it was grown in, the, what's in your water. So, so it's always gonna be an average, but definitely thinking about, you know, there's di these different stages of it and you're gonna have a different, different microbial composition of your lacto ferment on day three than you're gonna have at day 30. Um, and, and so that seven to 14 day window is definitely when I hear you're at your like prime lactobacilli, uh, takeover. Um, but if it's really cold, it's probably going to take a little longer for those microbes to get active. Um, and if you have, you know, like a lot of minerals in your water that might inhibit some things. So there are like mitigation factors. Um, I mean, you can get really nerdy and like, you know, order like test kits to find out. Um, but I, I will also say, and like, this is something I talked about a little bit in my video is like regular tasting can actually help you understand the chemical makeup intuitively, which is very cool. And you, you might not think that you're qualified, but I swear every single one of you is qualified to tell how a ferment feels and tastes just by paying attention and, and noticing. So every time you're tasting something, be like, ah, I taste it this way. And, and if you're tasting it on day four, it's going to taste different than day 14. And just practicing adjusting your palate and your, and your description language, um, just by doing that regularly, you will be able to have more information about the microbial composition um, of what you're eating. So like, you know, there's that too, of just like using, you know, your like body's intuition to be like, ah, I think that this is a more mature ferment or this is a more, you know, complex ferment. Um, this has more microbes in it. Um, but I'd be really curious if lactobacilli has like a flavor. So that's definitely the question I'm going to be researching after this. Yeah, I think something to also stress in Molly's presentation too is um, the temperature. I remember my first time making kraut was a total flop. And so that's okay because I made it in the peak of the summer. It was so hot out. And it fermented so fast and just turned to mush and it was bubbling everywhere in the cupboard. And so those things are gonna happen and it's gonna be fine and definitely keep trying because it is frustrating when you lose like a whole, like four mason jars of kraut. But um, maybe you could try out with like a quart first and figure out the temperatures that work and um, try to pick a pretty consistent space in your house. Um, um, I am getting a question from Pamela about sourdough and sourdough is something that I'm pretty new to, but very excited about. Um, I make a lot of sourdough pancakes. Um, and the, the way that I can explain the question, uh, or the way that it makes sense to me is thinking about fermentation as like pre-digesting. So when you're just making a loaf of bread without a sourdough starter, you're adding in yeast. There's no there's no digestion time. There's no time for the gluten to be broken down. There's no time for the nutrients in the wheat to be made 
more available and more digestible to your body because they've like, you know, the, the harder parts of it have been broken down by the, the bacteria in the sourdough starter. So I'm not saying that like one is better than the other. It's just what makes them different. And, and the slower process of the sourdough and the resting time and the ability for the microbes to be active um, can, can really change the makeup of the nutrient density, can change the flavor, can change the way it feels. And, and yes, you would think that putting it in the oven, yes, it technically kills the living parts of the sourdough starter, but all of those benefits of the transformation due to the bacteria are still super present. So you are getting the benefits of fermentation when you're eating sourdough, even though it's not no longer like technically alive. Um, and, and some treats that are made with, with the yeast and, and the non-sourdough, super delicious as well. You know, there's just like all, all the ways of making things. Um, and, but that is what is exciting about sourdough to me is that pre-digestion. And I, I'm pretty sure that Annie has a look on her face like she wants to add something to this. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> She's just excited about sourdough too. Um. No, no, Molly, I'm just really excited about sourdough as well. Really excited about sourdough. Yeah, I just like kind of put my hands up in the air, get like kind of kind of flary. That's <laughs> I want to know more about, I, um, I started learning a little bit about sourdough last year. I lived at a sourdough bread bakery, so I think I'd be able to answer this more. Um, but, um, but people are really passionate about sourdough right now, and I think it's like a really thing to a culture of um, slower ways of doing things, um, of, of increasing the nutrients. You know, flour that's been milled only really holds its nutrients for a couple of days. Um, and, and so that leaching um, is, is a definitely a thing that's present in our industrialized bread um, culture. And so, yeah, sourdough just like reclaiming a lot of those, those ways of making sure that the bread we're eating is, is just as nutritious as the crops um, and honoring the wheat crop that, that made it. Well, it is 8.15 and to respect people's time, we've gotten a lot of questions in and I know that like I'm leaving with more questions than I came with. Um, so please feel free to keep the conversation going um, offline and in the fields. And we still have a couple of gleans left um, and maybe I'll pass it back over to Merle because I know that we wanna um, get everyone excited about any other upcoming events that we have um, as well as wrap up, so. Yeah, I was just going to say, before people start filtering out, um, we are having a Friendsgiving virtual potluck next week on Thursday, the 19th. Um, this will be a very fun event. Me and Annie will be singing and playing guitar. Um, you have to come see okay. us. <laughs> and, and Molly playing flute, um, potentially. We'll see. And um, you can come with your dinner. We're going to have um, Hope Star Wars coloring pages. We're going to wrap up the season, let everyone know everything that we accomplished this year and thank our volunteers for everything that they do for us. Um, and then talk about next steps for Hope's Harvest and um, where we're going and then wrap up with a toast. So make sure to register. The link is on Facebook. It's coming out on the MailChimp this weekend. Um, it'll be just boosted on social media and make sure you register so you can get the coloring pages before you come. Um, and we're gonna have a really fun time. Um, but if that's all of the questions that we have for today, um, I just wanna let everyone know that um, Everyone who attended tonight will be getting a follow-up email with um, a link to the recorded video, um, a link to resources that me, Molly, and Annie have on canning, dehydrating, freezing, and fermenting. Um, and then we'll also write up um, a Q&A, all the questions that have been asked tonight. Um, so you'll have um, access to everything that was in the chat and everything that was said tonight. Um, and I believe that's it. Um, so this was just a, a little web webinar to get everyone started. And I want to thank everyone for, for being here.
Shout out to for sharing all of your knowledge. What was that? Um, thanks for sharing all your knowledge and holding it down and being an amazing presenter too. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thanks, Connie. Good night, thank you. Thank you too. Bye everyone. Thank you so much, this is amazing. Good night, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.